other spiralling costs of domestic heating. I'm on the lookout now for supply and heat within the greenhouse to keep the plants ticking over. Earlier in the year, or late last year, I started onions off in the Vitapods, but I didn't actually use any bottom heat. It's not saying I'm not going to use them at all, it's there as a reserve, but I've actually invested in one of these, what they refer to as a Chinese diesel heater. There are other popular brands out on the market as well. Um, there's been mixed results with these, so I've spent a lot of time doing a lot of research on various YouTube videos. And with all that in consideration, I've purchased one of these. I've actually had this almost a year now, so I'm going to actually try and get this commissioned within the greenhouse. There's one or two modifications that I want to do. You can actually use this more or less straight out the box. With the only addition, you need to provide a power supply. We'll look into that a bit later on. But first of all, I want to remove the cover and show you the first thing that I'm going to change. Hopefully that's got the screw in. There is quite a few different configurations of these you can get, but basically they're all the same. You've got a fuel tank, an heat exchange, a cum burner, with a glow plug, a little atomizer, and it works just like that. Um, you, can, you can actually split it down and divide it into separate sections. I've seen people put the tank in a different room, but as it is, I'm going to keep this as a compact unit. So, tipping it upside down, you'll see there's two little ports there. One of them is the exhaust, and the other one is an air intake. And right next to the air intake, there's another little pipe, which is the fuel pipe, which is where you can see this connected to here. Now, that is the first modification that I want to do, because quite a lot of people have, con have made comment about this. The fuel pipe is too flimsy and flexy. In general, the fuel pump in here emits, I think it's 0 0.02 of a milliliter per pulse. So obviously, depend what frequency you got it set at is how much fuel you get put in. But I'm saying that uh, they advise to put a much firmer fuel line in, and I've actually purchased one off the internet, which is here, and this is a quite firm plastic. You get the rubber connectors, also some decent Jubilee clips. And included in this kit and all is a, a fuel pump, although I've actually, fuel filter, sorry, I've actually got one already set up in there, but not, not to worry about that. So the first job I'm going to do is replace the fuel lines on this. For ease of fitment of the pipe to each end of the fuel pump, I'm actually going to take it out. It's only one nut and bolt what's holding it to the frame. There is a bit of concern though, because the fuel pump's lying flat, and... Uh, a lot of viewers on other channels have actually said that the fuel pump needs to be up at an angle around about 45 degrees to start with to prime it and that will get rid of any air locks. Well, I'll try it flat anyway and if need be, I'll actually reposition it. However, I'm just going to tap this out now to connect the pipes. You'll see the electrical connector on the end there. There's a little wire here, which if you just pull that out, it'll actually let the two connectors come apart and make it easy to fetch it out. Well, that's the pipe work done out fully. I've kept the original pipe from the fuel tank up to the fuel pump, and that is the one there with the black arrow pointing on. I have added an inline filter, which is at the back at an angle, you can just about see it. And it goes out, and from the fuel pump on, it's got the new piping on. You can see the black casing there with the clips on. And then it goes all the way around, comes back in through the wall there, up and then it goes into the atomizer and burn chamber. A little look at the fuel filter. So this is from the fuel tank in between the tank and the fuel pump. These usually don't come with the unit so it's well worth for a few extra pounds to purchase one of these because it does stop any debris actually getting into the pump. Um, the top has got a cap which will screw off so it is you can actually take the filter out, give it to clean and put it back in. It's also worth mentioning that uh, in places where things have been attached to the case, screws have just been used and the excess is just left protruding. So do be careful that you don't catch your hands or even puncture the pipe or the fuel tank. Another thing worth noting on this model in particular 
is that the fuel outlet from the tank doesn't come from the bottom, but it's slightly raised. That means you won't get the full capacity of the fuel tank, but on the plus side, if there's any debris in there, it'll actually sink to the bottom and won't travel through to the fuel pump. So now I've got the new pipe working. What I'm going to do before I bolt it down into its final place is do a, a quick lash up and get it running. Primarily to make sure that the fuel is going up and to where it should do and also to check that there's no leaks. So in the packet as standard comes this pipe here which is the air intake and we've got a little filter that pops on the end there with a jubilee clip and the other end pops onto the bottom there and this is the standard exhaust pipe now I've actually bought a longer one of these and that's the reason for that but for the setup we'll actually put this one on and there's also a little uh, exhaust box a silencer or if you're in the states a muffler and uh, I'll probably not put that on because it'll only be running for a couple of minutes anyway let's get this sorted So that's the unit with the pipes all clamped in position. Now because they exit from the bottom and got to turn a 90 degree bend, it looks like we've got to raise this old body up on uh, legs. In fact, I'm going to build a, a proper stand for it, but uh, for the meantime, I'm going to prop it up. I've got that uh, propped up on a couple of bricks. As you can see, it's uh, made enough clearance to get the pipes out. Next thing to do is think about supplying power. Now this is the power lead which comes in, it's got an actual inline fuse, not sure what the writing is. There's different ways of powering this, you can actually use like a, a leisure battery or have something on a trickle charge, solar panel or something like that. But I've chosen to go down the route of using the mains power supply and this is a, a transformer. I think it's about a 30 amp because I read on when they start up they'll draw anything between 9 and 12 amps so this is more than adequate. All this is, you've got a mains power supply coming in there. There's your live, neutral and earth. And there's six banks here, and there's three positive and three negative, all with 12 volt output. So we've connected this, you're still going to have two 12 volts spare. And you could, if you want to, in a building or something like that, maybe rig some LED lights. So it's running off really nothing. So I'm going to connect the wires up with this now. So that's it connected. And before I plug in, I'm going to fill the fuel tank. Right, I've got the power on and the actual board is lit up very very difficult to see the manual's not all that clear and I've waded through it and I've actually met some crib notes here to do the various tasks on this controller but the first thing we've got to do is is to prime the system and that's to get the fuel from there through the actual filter up to the fuel pump into the burn chamber and the way we have to do this is to press the star or on some of the controls that could actually be a little spanner press that and the down arrow together. Don't be alarmed by that knocking noise. All it is, that's the actual priming system going on. The uh, fan has just kicked into motion. I'm looking down to the control there now. You can see the glow plug and the air intake actually starting to flash. I'm feeling outside the exhaust can actually feel something blowing so now that's going to fire up to temperature and hopefully we should get some warm air coming out soon and the 
the air's just starting to warm up now. That's nice and toasty now. That smoke coming off there is because I left the pipe on the soil tray and it's melted a little old. <laughs> So now the, the heater's proven to be running and there's no leaks. I'm going to start the permanent install. First job I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to build a raised platform from it, a wooden structure, just to lift it up so those pipes can come out easily. Like, but if you noticed here, this is the exhaust pipe. It's an extended one. I think this is about two metres long. And the idea is that when I've cleared all this rubbish out of here, I'm going to actually site the heater right by the door on its pedestal but I want to run the exhaust along the base now I've got a, a raised metal base on there so there's no problem with running this along on the concrete floor and I'll go along probably about one and a half meters and then go out through the frame put the muffler on and openly then I can gain the benefit of the heat generated by the exhaust I've just done me a little sketch here and that there is going to be the stand for the heater. It's made out of a decking board and I've done a little cutting list there. Get my chop saw out and be, this will be done in no time. If you notice along the bottom there's like a little brace. I'll put a hole in there and that's where I want to have the air vent coming out. It's amazing how having the right tools for the job makes it so much easier and quicker. That's all the wood cut now, ready for the stand. I was going to start fixing it together today, but just take the battery of the drill that needs charging. The temperature's dropping, so I think I'll put that down as a job for tomorrow. I built the unit, it looks a bit uh, sturdy, but uh, I wanted to do something which was uh, all in one, so I mean, that's all together, part as one. I put this part to the center here, and I'm going to chop that off. And I've got a little vent to put in there, which you can rotate and change the direction. Um, the air vents come up the side, I've just put that on with a little zip tie. And there's the exhaust coming out the back. The odd part is I've drilled a hole in the support base on the greenhouse. So I'm going to thread that through, but the difficult part is just as we come to the greenhouse, probably about 150 mil out of there, there's a wall. So I've got to put the pipe in and try and get a sharp bend to get it out. That's going to be the difficult part. Another issue with the design of this style of uh, heater is the inspection window. As you can see here, the actual fuel tank is more like, all the way up to here and yet you can only see that part. I've actually marked one litre in the spot there so what I'm going to actually do is take the cover back off and uh, run the angle grinder up the cover to make the, the full height of the top so you can see in the fuel tank how much fuel is actually in there, not just when you're running low. see it's quite a deep fuel tank and that's what we've got at the moment just push that in and pop the cover over it doesn't show very well there but depending what fuel I'm actually using 
you'll probably get a better indicator. But at least we can see right the way up to the top of the tank now. While we're on the subject of fuel, this wonderful thing will burn on quite a few different types. I am using diesel at the moment, conventional diesel, white diesel, what they use in the motor cars. Well, I've got a supplier nearby who does supply um, red diesel. That's the stuff which has got the dye in and also exempt from certain taxes. You can run this on uh, paraffin, kerosene, domestic heating oil, and I've seen on YouTube some people are actually running it on used motor oil. Although the government now have issued where you need a license, I think it's through DEFRA. It's about three thousand pounds plus initially, then it's one thousand five hundred ish per year. That's to burn used oil. Although I don't think I'll be using it. Uh, so at the moment, so I've got conventional diesel in, and then I'm going to be using red diesel probably. And if I can get it, I'm going to be using kerosene. There's one other thing I forgot to mention, and it's probably, in fact, it is the most important thing of all. Is whenever you're in an enclosed space and with an internal combustion engine of any sort, there's a risk that it can give off a carbon monoxide, which is fatal, actually, it can be, depending on the levels. So I've obtained a little carbon monoxide detector there. It's got an LCD screen, a test button there, and it's couldn't read in zero parts per million which is what i want to see so this will be active all the time in the greenhouse when the heat is on well it'll be it all the time so any levels that do rise it will warn me so i can get out and have a look what's causing it i'll just quickly show you the setup i've got for the power and that you might recall that's the little transformer i've got i've got a sheet of aluminium and uh, Conveniently bolted to the slots underneath the uh, top shelf and there's the feed going in there and the white cable is the mains and the other one's the 12 volt going down to the heater. So now we've got the heater up and running. Just before I finish off I'd like to mention a few words about this uh, little LCD panel here which clips off the front of my model like that. First of all, you'll notice that the lead is quite short, so I've purchased some three-core tinned marine cable, I think they called it, and uh, I'll be splicing into that a bit later on and putting it underneath the shelf together with the transformer. Normal viewing of this is very, very poor. It's very difficult to see, and I find it holding it at an angle gives you the best vision of it. So I'll be doing a bracket which is angled and fits under there. But uh, the main thing I wanted to mention was that uh, I say I've trawled quite a few videos on YouTube regarding these heaters and there's one in particular if I can remember his name I'll put the link underneath where he actually goes into fine detail how to tune because I think these controllers are set out with the parameters more or less just to get the heaters working and that's it they're not optimized for maximum performance and minimum fuel and this guy goes into the depth of how to tune it and you go into what they call a secret menu or engineer's menu or something like that anyway on most of the controllers i've seen you press the top left hand button which is the star or might be the spanner on some press it three times i think and that'll give you four horizontal bars and that gives you the opportunity then to enter a code to get into these menus and on this one and most of the others the code is one six Eight, eight. So you press the up and down arrow to change the digits. Once you get one, press the OK. That'll jump you across to the next digit. Six, OK, eight, OK, eight. And that, the first figures you see there are the upper and lower limits for the frequency for the fuel pump. Now I think mine was set something like 1.9, maybe. So what you have to do first is get your heater up to maximum heat and the way you know that along the bottom right hand corner of the panel there's six bars two two of i think it's green orange then red and there's your progress once them six bars you know your heater is up to maximum heat and once you're in there then you've got the opportunity of changing the upper and lower frequencies of your of your fuel pump i think Mine was say it was 1.9, I think it was. 
And the idea is you keep lowering the frequency, come out the menu and check the heating bars, make sure they're six. As soon as that drops down to five, whatever the figure is you've set it at, I think mine was about 1.4 when it dropped down to five bars. I actually knocked it up one and it jumped back to six and I saved that. And you do that again by going up to the maximum and I think it was mine was something around about 7,000, the upper limit was. Well, eventually I got it down to 5,500 before it dropped down to five bars. I knocked it up, saved it. And the next menu you go into after adjusting the frequency of the fuel pump is the fan speeds. And again, you've got maximum and minimum rev lights. And again, mine was way out and you adjust them exactly the same as I did there, keeping your eye on the uh, six bars at the bottom. The other menus you go across, it'll show you uh, set it to 12 volts or 24 volts. And another one is, it depends on how many magnets are in, I think, I don't fully understand it. Anyway, by setting them settings, I've knocked the frequency down that I can run it on to get full heat quite a lot. And obviously that saves on fuel economy. Because if you run it on too much fuel, is going to be unburned fuel going through and also you're going to be depositing carbon in the burn chamber which you don't want because these have got no fuel injectors bear in mind it's just an actual fuel pump and an atomizer so that's the way it works with the glow plug so once you know what frequency you're running on as i say it's hertz if you go back to your school days you know that hertz one hertz is one cycle every second so if you're on 1.4 or 1.6 every second it's doing 1.6 cycles. And it's general consensus of opinion, the pumps were in there disperse around about 0 0.2 of a milliliter for every stroke. So if you know how many strokes it's doing a minute, there's, say it's 1.6 frequency, so 1.6 strokes every second, you can then work out how many milliliters you're using, you're using 1.6 times 0 0.02, that's how many milliliters you're using every second. Multiply that by 60, it'll tell you how much milliliters you're using every minute. Then multiply that by 60 again, and it'll tell you how many milliliters you use in an hour. Now you might wonder why you want to know that. Well, <laughs> I've got a spreadsheet I've done here. So if I say I want to run my heater for 10 hours, and now I've done my fuel tank, I've put the levels on marked in, in litres so I can tell how much fuel I've actually got in the tank. So if I wanted to run, say, my heat for 10 hours, and then now I've got two and a half litres left in the tank, if I look down this chart here, I can the maximum frequency I can run that motor without running out of fuel is going to be 3.4 hertz. I'll just put a picture of this screen up on the front there. So... Normally, I've got to be honest, the cold weather we've had, I've run this at the lowest frequency, which I think is 1.6 I'm using on there, and it's kept the temperature up about 8 degrees even when we've been down to freezing. So I can't see using that very much, but although it, this chart said if I need to, if, I, if I'm running low on fuel, I can actually adjust the frequency of the pump, knowing that it's going to run for a set duration of hours. And that's about it. As an extension to that little chart, I've just shown you the XL1, I've added another one to the side, whereby I can enter the cost of a litre of fuel that I'm using, and it'll actually work out the running cost, depending on what frequency and the length of time you're doing. At the moment, I'm able to get all the red diesel from a local transport supplier, and that is working out about 147 a litre at the moment. One thing worth a mention with the diesel eaters is the using the correct shutdown procedure. Now if you're using a main supply to your transformer to get the power to the heater and you get regular power cuts, this can be an issue because if you don't shut the heater down correctly, there's a risk that the heat left in the heat chamber can actually fry and cook the motherboard, causing it damage or maybe useless even. The way it does work is by pressing the on off button, you'll see off come on in the LCD, it'll display OFF, and then the burner will actually stop, but the fan will continue. Now this runs probably three or four minutes 
and it's actually dispersing quite a lot of heat out. It'll change speed a number of times and all of a sudden it'll stop and then it's done. While we're on the subject of heat and all, I did buy, as you saw earlier, probably a long exhaust pipe and the idea of that was to run the exhaust down the length of the greenhouse, then out through the bottom end to uh, make use of actually the heat coming off the pipe. But in the end, because the amount of heat this was giving off, even on its lower setting, I didn't think I needed. But out in YouTube land, I've seen some wonderful videos what people have done to actually make use of the heat coming off the exhaust. I've seen one obviously using a full length pipe and getting that the radiation from that, the heat radiating. The other thing I've seen done is uh, actually getting a single skin radiator, putting the exhaust into one end, exiting the bottom end of the exhaust, then piping that out of the building, and it's the hot gas going through the radiator which actually generates heat. But the best one of all I saw was actually it set a little central heating system up where it got a reservoir. The heating pipe actually went through it, the exhaust did, which warmed the water up, and then it got a, a little 12 volt pump pumping out into a radiator, and that was coming back out back into the tank again as a recycle and it was actually heating the radiator up but going back to the, the one I was on about previously where you got hot gas coming through a radiator I was thinking about that as a bit of a farther development is if you got a thin radiator tipped it horizontal and actually suspended it underneath your workbench and the heater was going you'd have the exhaust gas traveling through the radiator and out but the heat off that radiator would be ideal, I think, for heating the bench bottom heat for seedlings. And I don't think it'd be too fierce that it'd cook them. But as I say, this heater is giving plenty of heat off as it is, so there's no need for me to even worry about that. Ideally, if you've got a big polytol or something, that'd be something I'd seriously consider. But as it is, I'm OK. And one final thing is you can actually put this on the timer as well tell it to start or stop but I've not bothered with doing that instead with mine and with quite a lot of them you get a little uh, remote control and that so if late at night I realize that the temperature is dropping a bit I can just press the button pop the heater on now I'm full well the green is going to be heated and they haven't got to come out in the cold talking about fuel I've got a big five litre jerry can here five litre I think 20 litres actually and regarding getting fuel in, into the tank, what I was doing originally was putting a funnel through the gap, lifting up and tipping it, and it's getting a bit quite messy. So I've been onto the internet and purchased this siphon. It's got a one-way valve and it's got an arrow in there, one way. So pop that into the fuel tank, obviously lift it higher than this petrol tank, the burner. Pop that into the heater and just squeeze that, and I can watch the fuel rising up the mark until it's reached the top and just take it out so that's about it we're all set with the heater should we get any more bad weather saying that we've had quite a few mild nights just recently and but we have got more frost coming in we are still just gone into february so i do expect we'll have frost for the next at least two months so we've always got this on standby so many thanks for watching hope you found it useful and i hope to see it again soon bye for now